Hato, good morning everybody. So, somebody commented and said, when's part two of the bow making coming up? So, I decided I'd do it right now. <laughs> but, before we talk about uh, that, I wanted to say I, I realized I kind of did things out of order. Um, and, uh, oh, I've got uh, bow making part one kind of in one of the later steps of um, that video so I wanted to take it and turn it all the way back to the beginning and then um, kind of talk about where I go what what does my process look like from selecting a stave or cutting down a tree um, at the very beginning and then bringing that up all the way to actually finishing a bow um, and I've got some uh, staves and some bows that I'm going to talk about. Um, it's different types of wood, so the choice of wood that you're going to use, um, the size of the tree that you want to use um, for making a, a traditional bow, and then um, also to uh, the techniques used to um, take off the bark and the sapwood, um, or if it's a white wood, you know, how not to um, tear into that first growth ring, um, which would be my choice for backing. And so, uh, and then in another video, I think here after this, I'm going to talk a little bit about arrows and the selection of materials for those, um, types of fletching, pros and cons um, to use in different styles of fletchings. Um, so these will be two separate, um, two separate videos that I'll do kind of back to back here. But as you can see right here, I've got a bunch of um, staves. Uh, most of them are black locust. I've got two ash staves or two ash logs here. Um, I've got some honey locust, which is not um, related very closely to black locust. Um, they're not in the same genus. And then I've got some finished bows. Um, black locust is my favorite, my favorite bow wood. So this is my personal bow. Um, it's a black locust bow, and uh, this is what I use. Um, you know, I haven't gone hunting with it yet. I always promise myself that you know this bow is going to be my bow. This bow is my bow. You know I'm going to make this bow, and this bow is going to be going to be mine. And it never works out that way. I always end up selling them um, or giving them to people who who want to learn. And that's the other thing too. Uh, I do make bows to sell, and I do make arrows to sell. But tribal people that want to learn, you know, it shouldn't cost you anything. And so um, if you can present a tribal ID to me I mean, a genuine interest that you want to know these things and know your own traditions um, then we'll find you somebody in your community who knows these things or if they don't then I can be maybe a substitute but um, you know these these things are very important there's a big conversation in the native world today about food sovereignty um, and having less dependence on commercially produced food and that conversation is generally oriented towards agriculture but a secondary part to that, I believe, should be hunting. Um, and hunting with firearms is great, but our traditional forms of hunting are um, much more sustainable. And I think they, they really should be utilized by tribal people more and more um, if we're going to continue on on that path. So this is a black locust bow. It's 55 pounds. Uh, excellent bow, really fast shooting, um, and a uh, really clean piece of wood, even though it's got some character on it. I do kind of like that, um, but I don't make really character bows very often. Um, but this is too, um, you know, our traditional style, uh, which is pretty much all that I make, and unless I get like a, a specific order for, you know, a handle bow, which really never happens. Um, but it's just been through the handle, and you know, it doesn't taper very much. It's um, I think like one and a quarter inches wide here. And then it's like seven eighths at the Knox. So, but even still, even though it's not terribly narrow at the Knox, it does shoot um, pretty quick. Take an arrow out here for you. And just, I don't know how well video is gonna be able to pick it up, but just take. It is a nice snappy bow. And I think that's one of the reasons I really like Black Locust is because it's, it's nice and lightweight because you're not using as much wood but the wood is stiffer and denser, so you can make a, a more efficient bow like this guy here. This is a black locust bow that I'm uh, currently working on. It's um, 72 inches long, 
Um, it's almost two inches wide um, and uh, it's about 75 pounds um, and I'm just I'm still in the process of tillering um, this guy but this will be going to a friend of mine as a gift. This is a ash uh, bow. Um, this one actually is a little bit heavier. This one pulls about 115 pounds now. Um, I've lightened it up some. It was pulling almost 130. Um, but uh, yeah. I'd still need to do some work on the um, tips. The tips. And you can see I am. I'm, I'm pinch drawing this. Um, the tips ah, need some um, work. They're still a little bit stiff, so it's got some hand shock because there's so much weight up on the front. This is a hickory bow um, in uh, a style very, very similar to what people here on this, on this eastern coast are using. Just a very simple D bow, um, kind of an oval cross section. Uh, with post knots um, on either end, um, kind of what looks like what's in the uh, Ashmolean, or uh, what the Ashmolean bows come out of Virginia. And then this is a similar style, but <laughs> not so much. This is a black palm bow. This is actually an original um, bow. I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, I should say this is an old bow, and it was made in South America. Um, by one of the tribes there. It's black palm. It's incredibly dense. It's probably about a hundred years old. Um, and you can see one of the more interesting things about it is it's got this groove that runs down the, um, the belly. Um, and my thumb just fits perfectly in that, which is great because that's how I shoot, is to, is to put my thumb on the back. And I actually kind of replicated that with this bow uh, and making it. I, I, I introduced a, a groove into the into the belly side so I like it I may continue doing that on some on some bows but yeah this is an old bow and the reason I kind of made that distinction is that these are all original bows um, they're not replicas or reproductions these are Indian bows and that's a very important thing to think about is that they're not dead Indians aren't gone um, we're still alive and we still make stuff and we still hunt this way even though it may not be mainstream or popular, there's a pretty decent group of people who um, still do this. And you're probably not going to see it very often because if they are doing these things very traditionally, they may not be social media freaks. They may not be very keen to post things or to share things, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but I want tribal people to know that these things are still acceptable and common and that you know, it's not just uh, non-native people making a living because the Indians don't have their culture anymore. That's bullcrap. And I think that it's time that we stepped up and uh, took it back. So that's why I say that this is an old bow, but they're all originals. <laughs> these are all made by tribal people, and these things are still being carried on. <clears throat> so selecting your stave or selecting your tree is going to be the first um, thing that you have to think about. This ash right here is maybe about six inches in diameter. And this is great because you can get four, at least four bows out of this right here. About this. I would say this is my perfect diameter for making bows. I can fit just I can touch my fingertips around um, the circumference of this tree, and that's what I'm looking for. If I go up to a tree and I can, I can grip it, um, you know, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Um, this is going to make a really, my preferred bow with a, a slightly uh, curved back and a flat belly. And like I said, the rest of these here are honey locust and black locust. Black locust is my favorite. This is my favorite bow wood, um, and unfortunately, it's environmentally it's got some um, problems going on where it's dying out, and so it's becoming a little bit more rare, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, 
Uh, hopefully we don't see it go the way of the, the chestnut, but um, that's my favorite bow wood. I don't really use Osage. I know a lot of people really, really praise Osage as being the, the best bow wood. Um, and it's, I would say it's the most versatile bow wood, but there's no such thing as best, um, in my opinion. Because these things are all, I mean, these bows are all very efficient and very fast. Um, good shooting bows and you know some of them are made from hickory this one's made from ash but black locust is my favorite <laughs> not the best but it's my favorite um, so and it's a very picky wood and that's one of the things I actually like about it is it, it it doesn't let you get away with anything Osage and hickory and you know um, other white woods and things like that you can get away with a lot of stuff um, you know, tillering mistakes, and they'll kind of even out themselves, you know, um, but locust doesn't take it. It'll, it'll let you know if you do something wrong, and it kind of pushes me to always make my bows a little bit better. Um, and so you have to think about those kinds of things, what you're going to be using your bow for. Are you going to be using it for hunting, which is primarily the purpose of having bows today, or target shooting. Um, you know competition and that kind of thing so these are the two kind of realms that we have to think about today but in the past also you have that added um, use of bows as being military weapons which is an old concept now um, but there are tribes today in the world that still use their bows in conflict uh, and so they might look a little bit different than what we make today so this bow I would say is probably a pretty ideal hunting bow um, it's just nice and smooth and it's not terribly long I think it's like 64 inches long or something like that um, it's about 55 pounds and it slings arrows very fast so it's lightweight um, you know you don't have to worry about carrying something that's you know four or five pounds um, six seven pounds you know think about this the difference between this and a rifle um, another thing too is if your bow is quiet shooting, you know, if you've got nice, um, a nice tiller and, uh, you know, lighter weight tips, um, and your bow doesn't twang or click or snap when it, um, shoots, um, and that's another benefit of slightly slower bows is that they're a little bit quieter, um, you know, you can get away with maybe one or two shots, especially in small game. Um, you know, if you miss your first one, um, then uh, you may be able to take another shot. It's not often that you get to do that, but it does happen. So, but yeah, so you have to think about what you're going to use your bow for, uh, what kind of wood you're going to make it out of. Now, locust is um, very, very dense, and it's very, it's very strong, but it, um, it lacks compression strength. It's very high in tension, um, but if you don't treat it right, you can get crystals um, all along your belly where the wood is actually compressed, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna stretch back. It's not gonna. Um, so it's hard, but it's hard to a fault. So that's why I like smaller um, logs for making locust bows, is because they have a rounded back. Um, if they don't, like this guy here, um, you can see it's very flat. Um, so what I've done is I've actually taken and rounded the back myself. Just I just take sandpaper in my hand and then I just follow um, and it just rounds off the edges. And what it does is it actually kind of gives the effect of making it from a smaller piece of wood um, where you know you don't have as much tension and the bat or in the belly can um, kind of support that a little bit better. Um, so now you don't have to worry about that with white woods or um, you know osage or that kind of thing. Um, but it's just one added detail you have to think about if you're going to use woods that are higher in tension or uh, higher in compression. You have to build according to the to the wood. So this uh, ash you can get away with any bow style you want, go for it, do anything. Uh, you want a round cross section like an English longbow, do it. You want a big wide flat paddle bow, go for it. Locust, um, you know, there's a reason that these two bows here are different widths. This one's a heavier poundage. 
Um, it can't take this poundage in this dimension. It just, it would crystal up and it would probably break. So you have to make it according to um, what, the, what the wood wants to do and what you can get away with. So selecting your tree, go out there and find a good one, not dead, not fungus growing on it. Um, you know, something that's young and alive and straight. And the only thing that you can't work with, or the only thing I can't work with, really, or don't want to work with, it's just not worth doing for me, is twist. I can do anything with knots, um, you know, with, with wiggles in the grain, you name it. I don't like to work with twist. And the reason why is because um, it torques the bow. Even if you steam it and heat it out um, 50 or 60 years down the road, um, you may need to do it again because the wood is always going to go, gonna want to go back to that state. So I try to work with the straightest, best pieces of wood that I can find. I don't always get it um, here on the coast of Virginia, but when I lived on uh, on tribal lands down in Oklahoma, bow wood was pretty much everywhere. Um, so there's a lot of hickory around here, but hickory is not my choice wood. So yeah, so these are kind of some of the things. These will all get turned into bows, obviously. Um, some of them haven't even been split out yet, like these guys, but. You want to find something that's going to suit your needs and you have to decide what those needs are first. So once you decide that, once you have your staves uh, selected, I usually let mine dry. I'll split it out immediately. So I'll cut the tree down and I'll split it right then and there. Um, and I'll let it dry anywhere between um, two weeks to a month, depending on how busy I am. And then I'll actually take and rough out um, without touching the bark. Don't, don't touch the bark yet. I'll rough out. Um, a bow. I'll take off a lot of the wood and after that's done then I'll set it aside and I'll let it dry. Now you can soak it, you can, um, and I think there's actually a documentary um, with Al Heron, Outdoor Oklahoma, yep, Outdoor Oklahoma, Al Heron, he actually um, soaked his bows as well. Um, I know a couple of guys who do that and they actually have pretty good results. But I prefer to let mine um, air dry. Um, you know, I just keep them free of bugs. Um, you can seal the ends if you want. I don't. Um, I just prefer to trim off the excess once they've once they've cracked. Um, and uh, so yeah, so let them dry. You want? Um, I think I think people say you want between like three to five percent moisture. Um, I don't have a moisture gauge, um, so I just go by um, a couple of things. I go by. I go by feel, so I, the wood feels dry enough, um, and then of course time, so I know roughly how long they should sit and dry, and then sound. Um, you know, if I tap on the wood, you know, if I've got my bow roughed out, and I can sit here and I know that sound, you know, I, and I know what it should sound like when it's dry enough to be made into a bow. Um, now I also make stringed instruments so maybe it's just a crossover from that. Um, but uh, that's about what you're looking for. Um, I think I'll, um, I don't know how long my YouTube video limit is but um, I think uh, here in a minute I might cut this off and talk about roughing out a stave and maybe actually um, doing a little bit of that roughing out a stave and showing you what you're looking for. But the very most important thing that you have to think about is once you've got your tree selected, once you've got it cut down, once you've got it split and quartered, or if it's a sapling bow, um, you know, just starting to dry, um, is the back. That's the most important part of any bow, is the back. You want to make sure that your back is nice and clean. And um, we'll talk about growth rings and um, what to do with them, how to chase them. Now you can do that a couple different ways. You can do it with a draw knife, which is what most people do today or um, a more traditional method would be to use a crook knife um, and chase it that way, starting at the end and just working your way forward. Um, and uh, it takes a little bit more time. Um, there's really no you know, pro to it other than that it's more, the more traditional method. Um, you know, it gives you the same result. Um, draw knife, I would say, is probably a little bit quicker. But, uh, but yeah, so. 
I think I'm going to cut this off and then um, I'll post another video talking about chasing a growth ring and, um, you know, getting it down to the beginnings of a bow. So, now we're going to go check.